G'day guys and welcome to another episode of the Mindful Men podcast. I'm your host Simon Rinney and today we're getting mindful about shift work and how shift workers can thrive and not just survive. I'm really excited today. I've got Roger Sutherland from Melbourne, Victoria on the line. How are you going, Roger? I'm going very well. Thank you, Simon, and thank you for having me. No worries. Thanks for coming on. So you're a dad and you're a veteran shift worker, a nutritionist and health and well-being coach through a healthy shift. It sounds like a pretty cool CV. It's been a total change in direction for me, Simon. So what I did was um, I'm a veteran shift worker. I work in law enforcement here in Melbourne, in Victoria. Um, I've been doing that for almost four decades. At around wow. about 35 years, 34 years, my health was really suffering as a result of shift work. So I started on my own health journey because, you know, I was suffering from a condition which is known as sacral ileitis, which is inflammation through the hips. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I then went on my own research around nutrition and training and because I was told that I was going to have to be on anti-inflammatories for the rest of my life. So I thought what I would do is go off and research doing it. I ended up doing a few programs to get some unilateral movement through my hips. And I started feeling really good. Um, and nutrition, of course, food is medicine. It's possible medicine that we can actually have. And it's amazing how when I look back from where I was to where I am today, just by doing those little one percenters along the way and habit stacking, we tend to build on that to get to the stage where we can lose the dad bod, so to speak, and turn our life right around. So at 34, 35 years in my job, I was looking around and I could see that shift workers were really struggling, you know, um, with lack of education around what to eat, when to eat, what to do. So what I thought I'd do is I had my own journey, but I wanted to become evidence-based, learn properly around the chrononutrition, meal timing, what the best thing to eat is and when, and get evidence-based facts on it. So I went back and studied nutrition. I came out of that with a certification in evidence-based nutrition. So I'm a certified nutritionist now. In June of 2020, I actually had a um, what they call a TIA, which is a transient ischemic attack which is a minor stroke while I was out walking. As a result of that, I've completely pivoted now to being a uh, starting my own business, A Healthy Shift. And what I do is I now coach shift workers one-to-one -one in uh, nutrition and health and well-being, managing stress. And as you know, for the last two years, it's been horrendous, hasn't yeah. it? So, you know, with COVID, lockdowns, et cetera. So, yeah, we've been nursing um, emergency service workers and frontline healthcare workers through that, um, getting fantastic results. Wow. And the first question I thought of when I, when I looked up your CV is four decades in shift work. <laughs> Why? <laughs> it, why? Oh, no, no, it's a good question, isn't it, really? It's something that I've always been – well, I actually enjoy shift work, to be perfectly honest with you. I've always enjoyed it. I love the idea of going to the shopping center when, you know, there's nobody else around and, or, you know, you can time it instead of having to go on a Saturday morning when you're trying to battle with the rest of everybody trying to find a car park. Um, if you want to make doctor's appointments or specialist appointments, dentist appointments, they're always available during the day. And yeah. I, I love that. And, you know, you can go and play golf. You can go do whatever you want to do because you're not battling with everybody that has only got their Saturday or Sunday to be able to do that in or their roster day off. So, yeah, that's one of the main reasons. I've just really enjoyed it. Plus, with my children growing up, because um, I've got two children, with my children growing up, it meant that I could be more present, take them to school, pick them up from school, um, go to all of their functions. Of course, I missed out on a lot of their nighttime functions and obviously Christmas lunch, etc. but I was able to drop them off and pick them up. So, um yeah, I was a lot more present with the children during the days. Yeah, and so so you're in Melbourne. Have you been in Melbourne your whole life? Yeah, no, I've always been in in or not far from <laughs> Melbourne. I, I grew up in Melbourne until I was 10, and then we went down to Gippsland with a sea change with my parents who bought a business down in South Gippsland. Um, so I lived down in South Gippsland for a period of time and then came back up to Melbourne when I was 17 
and I've been back up in the city then and then started working doing what I'm doing at 20. And what am I now? 58. I just turned 58. So 38 years. It's a long yeah. time. So you're a Victorian. Are you into footy? I was into footy. Unfortunately, I've lost a bit of passion for the footy through COVID. But yeah. I'm a Hawthorne supporter. So I've had... I've actually just bought the three-peat book to relive through the um, glory days, three-peat, um, which, you know, I was very, very present, very supportive. I'm still a gold member of the club, and I um, I went to the game Saturday week ago, but I'm just a little bit disappointed in the AFL and how the AFL is, is going. It's, uh, yeah, anyway... Let's not talk about the footy at the moment. <laughs> I don't think my team's going so well at this point in time, but I must admit I've lost a lot of interest for the footy, but I'll get back there. It, it was yeah, awesome. yeah. I love talking about footy because um, I'm from Adelaide, so I'm a Crow supporter, and so it's nice talking to people who are fellow AFL lovers. But, yeah, we're not doing too well either. So, I'm, you know, we've got the camp thing that keeps coming up and we're on the bottom of the ladder, so. yeah. Fantastic. I travelled to Adelaide. I'll tell you what, um, I went over to Adelaide literally just for the footy. I've got a friend of ours who's a Port Adelaide supporter, and I know yep. that's to, you're not allowed to talk about that sort of stuff. <laughs> Don't hold it against me, Simon. Hold it against me that they're a Port Adelaide supporter. But what I loved was I absolutely loved the culture of Adelaide. Adelaide's a beautiful um, um, CBD, beautiful city. Highly recommend anybody that comes to Australia to visit Adelaide because it's got a very similar but more chilled culture than Melbourne's got. Mm. Um, Great, great cafe culture. And I love the mall, walking through the mall and then just seeing the Adelaide Oval there and being able to walk to the game, go to the game, and then afterwards come back and hit a few bars after. Well, apparently you can hit bars, I'm, I'm told. <laughs> yeah. It is nice, although I haven't lived there for, for quite a while. I've, I've lived in Canberra and, and Hobart and now um, and Brisbane and now the Sunshine Coast. So I've moved around a bit as well, so... But you're a dad, so I love talking to dads as well on the show. And, and tell me a bit about what what fatherhood means to you and, and your kids and, and life growing up with the kids. I was always made a very big point of being very present with my children. Um, and once again, being a shift worker and doing the job that I do, my children, um, I was able to be around them as I touched on before. So uh, that's always been really, really important to me to be able to go to the school events and be able to um, be there during the day with them and weekends and things like that because I predominantly worked um, twilight shifts or night shifts um, through a majority of their growing up. So I would be getting home from work at like uh, four o'clock in the morning, having a small nap, and then I would be getting up and taking the kids to school dropping the kids off at school, going back home, having a nap, getting back up, picking the kids up after school and bringing them home. Um, watching my kids flourish and go really well has been very rewarding for me. Um, my son just turned 30. He worked on a cruise liner for uh, six years. Cool. Five or six years. Um, he a, was a singer and dancer um, on, a, on a cruise liner. So I... I was able to take him on the weekends to his dance classes. And it's a very unique um, thing for a boy to be doing. Mm -hmm. But um, him working on the cruise ship gave me the opportunity to actually go on a couple of fantastic six-star cruise liners and, um, and, and enjoy the experience of seeing him actually working on the ship, which I found incredibly rewarding as well. We touched on, um, we touched on footy. And, and, yep. and our love for footy. And then you touched, and your son, singer and dancing. You know, footy culture is, is big in Australia and sports culture. But so taking your son to dancing and singing, what was that like as a dad? It was amazing. And I've always supported it, Simon. And I'll tell you why. And I always, and it's funny you should mention this because I always spoke about this with people that I would take my son to dancing on Saturday and then he would play footy on Sundays. Yeah. And and I'll tell you, it actually taught him balance. And if you go back and look at James Heard, James Heard was a, um, I think from memory, James Heard actually did ballet for many okay. years. And if you look at the poise, when you go back and you watch James Heard play football and you look at his poise, it actually, you can actually see it. Um, and I think you'll find that by people, um, um, we shouldn't demonise, we should support our boys doing whatever and we should support our girls doing whatever. Particularly now, Simon, because if you look at it, if my daughter said, oh, I want to go and play footy, would you support your daughter playing footy? Oh, 100%. 100%. So why wouldn't you support your son dancing? Because, you know, dancing's really cool. And I'll be honest with you, and, and we can talk about this because it's, it's, 
it's a bit of a hidden one. Look, Kyle always, my son, always said to me, Dad, I'm around some of the most beautiful women that God ever put breath into wearing bugger all, and I'm cleaning up here. <laughs> He's got it figured out. <laughs> he was way ahead of the game. He'd play footy on Saturday, then he'd go and dance with the girls on Sunday. He was way, way ahead of the game at that stage, Simon. Yeah, so... Um, it, not just a hat rack. Don't worry about hat rack. He's, uh, he got it all sorted out. Then he got the job on the cruise liner and he met his um, current fiance on the cruise liner as well. She was not a dancer, believe it or not. Um, she's a Romanian girl, uh, mm-hmm. beautiful, beautiful natured girl, worked in the retail on board the ship. Um, and they've been together and now they've given us the most beautiful granddaughter who's about to turn two years of age as well, um, young Luna. So I get to go and play grandpa now as well, which I did last weekend. It was difficult through um, COVID, not being able to travel mm. over that period of time but uh, or not being able to get to them. But now we're you know making the most of the time that we can actually spend with the two-year-old granddaughter. And Simon, that's a whole new world when you're a grandparent. <laughs> it's a whole new world. <laughs> Because you can fill them full of sugar, you can fill yes. them full of flowers, you can run them rampant, and then you just hand them back to the parent, get in the car and drive off and smile. <laughs> we're, we're in that five and a half and two and a half year old stage. So yep. we're on the, the receiving end of <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, I'm that grandparent, Simon. I'm that grandparent. I'm the one that fires them up and then leaves you with the mess to try and calm down. And you can do that because you've done the hard shift yourself, you know. I've done it all. I've done it all. Yeah, I've done the, you know, raising the children. So I've got a 30-year-old son. And now to go on to my daughter, my daughter's um, 28 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, my daughter um, quite cunningly um, has always wanted to be in the police. Uh, she's always wanted to be in the police for many, many, many years. Even And she was always that perfect person. She was always very present, very aware of who was around, very aware of who was in the room. Even though she didn't engage, she was an observer, and I always thought she was going to be the one. She'd be really good. Anyway, she... Um, uh, rang me one day out of the blue because, you know, you go through those difficult stages with your children as well. Like, you're yet to have those. I mean, oh, well, you probably think you're having them already. <laughs> you, you, you've had nothing yet. You wait until you've got a teenage daughter. Um, but, you know, f- through the period of about 18 to about 22, you know, my daughter and I had a very strained relationship for, you know, reasons that were sort of unknown. It's not something that we back over, but we had a bit of a strained relationship. Then out of the blue, she rang me and she told me that she was joining the police. And I said, yeah, you've always said that. And I've always thought that you'd be really good at it. So, you know, if there's anything that I can do, then let me know and I'll help you. And she said, no, 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 dad, I've already gone through the whole process. I start in two weeks. (laughs) I went, what? Wow. (laughs) Yeah. And she'd gone through the whole thing because she's a bit like that, Simon. She's doesn't want to let people down so she just does things she's a quiet achiever she does things quietly in the background and um so she's been in four years now she absolutely loves doing what she does she's very victim orientated so Mm -hmm. she helps victims and she absolutely loves it and i couldn't be prouder of what she's actually doing as a father of a police woman it's it's terrifying yeah absolutely terrifying in the world that we live in today um hence she doesn't realise, Simon, but when I text her 15 times a day, um, she thinks I'm just being a loving dad, but I'm actually just checking to make sure she's still around. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask that, like, you know, what was it like when she told you that she was t- starting in two weeks, like as a dad, like going into that yeah. kind of profession? I was really, really excited. I was mm. really excited because of my own background um, and, and it meant that I could live vicariously through her with what she was doing as well and things yeah. like that. So that was really exciting for me. And then I hung up the phone and then I thought about it and I went, wait, no, hang on a second. What what am I doing here? This is not good. I should. How do I talk her out of this? But I never have and I've always strongly supported Even though I'll chat with her on the phone and she'll tell me stories and I put the phone down and then I go and stick my fist in my mouth and bite down hard just to bring myself back to reality because I'm absolutely terrified of her being out there at night running Mm. around chasing, you know, um, criminals and things like that. But don't worry. My daughter can look after herself. Don't worry about that. No problems at all. And she now is actually... Um, engaged to um, another policeman, which she's been with for a long, long time from her polo cross days. Mm-hmm. Um, they've been together for, I think, nine years or so. And um, 
in November, I get to walk her down the aisle, which is going to be really exciting. And because she's in the police, it's being held at the uh, Victoria Police Academy, um, the wedding, and I get to walk her down the aisle of the police academy, which is where her mum and I got married as well, which is going to be a truly special event for us as well. So Wonderful. Um, that sounds amazing. Like, and, and thinking about your son and his dancing career, like what's your dance moves like? Have you got something in, in mind for, for the wedding? When I dance, when I dance, or even when I cross the floor to go and get a packet of chips, it looks like I've had an epileptic fit. <laughs> I'm not very good at dancing, Simon. Um, and I have to, obviously, I will be able to tap the uh, what will be her husband at the time on the shoulder to take my daughter for a dance. And I'm going to have to practice. I'm, I'm going to have to practice a lot to make it look like I'm not some loser because I'm not a great dancer at all, unless I've had six beers. I can't wait for my kids to have their weddings and I'm just going to tear up that dance floor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Be a great day. I'm looking, I'm really looking forward to the whole, the whole event. I just, I'm, I'm really looking. We've had a false alarm, Simon, because of COVID obviously, but mm. um, it's been uh, something that I'm really looking forward to now because it'll definitely be a go ahead now. Yeah. So, so was she planning to get married during COVID? Was that... Yeah, yeah, we had a date set last year and, um, uh, yeah, and we were in. I think the reason why she cancelled it was because everyone at the wedding had to wear masks and you weren't allowed to dance. Yeah. So they called it and they just cancelled it until they could have what they wanted because she wanted the full wedding. Yeah, thanks for that. It's that's a that's a costly experience, but anyway, she wanted the full wedding, and now we're going down the line of the full wedding, and um, um, it's going to be an amazing day. We're really, I'm really, really looking forward to. Now, Simon, you asked what it means to be a father in a, yeah. on a day like that. No one will be prouder. I I'm so humbled and so lucky that I get to go and see my daughter at home and mm. be there and ride with her to the church, the chapel, in the car. So I get to be first. I get to see her first. I get to ride with her. I get to walk down the aisle when she's going to be the absolute centre of attention, and she should be. She's worked very, very hard to put herself into a lovely shape for the wedding and things like that as well. Um, it helps when your dad's a nutritionist. Mm-hmm. That really help. Yeah. But um, we've worked around all of those sort of things for her, and it's been a long-term plan. She looks amazing. And she's going to look amazing on the day. And I'm going to be as proud as punch with her on the arm, walking down the aisle. And Simon, I could not be happier handing my daughter over to the man that I'm handing her over to. Um, Both of my children's partners are just exceptional human beings. Um, And I'm I'm just really, really happy, you know, because I know a lot of fathers just think, oh, no, 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 you know, my daughter. (laughs) But anyway. I've only met you this morning, but I feel proud for you as well. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. Oh, okay, so that's worked. <laughs> yeah. What about your wife? My partner is Melissa. Um, now, I've been with Melissa for 11 years. She's not the kid's mum, but okay. she's got the most incredible relationship with both of my children, um, purely because, oh, well, there was a story done on us all because we all work in emergency services. She's a, um, a police radio dispatcher, so she gets the golden... Um, job of being paid to tell the cops where to go, which mm-hmm. is always good. And um, yeah, she gets to go and do that and um, and loves her job. She works her two days on, two days off, two days on, two days off. So, um, you know, because of the shift work and things like that, we get to have those date days, Wednesday, date day, Thursday, all of mm-hmm. those sort of things, which works really well for us. She's been a great support of mine over the last, well, the whole time we've been together, but in particular over the last two to three years, I've had some, you know, stress and anxiety battles that I've been dealing yep. with as well in the background, because everyone's got a story, as you know, Simon, in the background, um, and you'll probably learn more about that. You know, the people that walk amongst us, you can't judge them by the, the their, not colour literally, but you can't judge them by their appearance because there's so much going on in everyone's life. Yeah. Um, but Melissa's been a great support for me through setting up a healthy shift, um, really encouraging. She's given me fantastic ideas. She's she's someone who I can bounce my ideas off, and she's always got really valuable input. Um, and she's currently studying to be a yoga instructor as well at the moment in the background. So, yeah, we're, we're a fairly driven family in relation to what we do and how we achieve. 
it's just like it sounds hectic actually <laughs> when I think about the shift work all over the place and so let's define shift work for, for listeners out there across the globe who are not familiar what shift work is can you tell us what what shift work is and and how it can impact the mind and body oh yeah so research defines shift work as anything that starts generally prior to 7 a.m. in the morning or finishes after 5 p.m. at night. So it is fairly loose, Simon, mm-hmm. um, but that's how they, they work it. Now, you'd be interested to know that just in Australia alone, because when we think of shift workers, let's be honest, what's the first thing that comes to mind? We think police, we think fire, we think ambulance, we think nurses. Mm-hmm. Yep. But what we do forget is we forget journalists, radio announcers. We forget um, we forget about pilots and uh, cabin crew and baggage handlers and people that work at the airport, taxi drivers, yeah. Uber drivers, restaurateurs, um, people that work in hospitality. You know, in Australia alone, Simon, we've got two million shift workers, right? Wow. Million, um, classified shift workers, and as if that isn't enough. We've recently learned that 30% of the Asian population are shift workers as well. Now, when you look at Asia, that's 1.4 billion shift workers, right? It's more than more than the population of Australia. A lot more. That's yeah. not, not million. That's billion. 1.4 billion. So um, it's even more than the population of the USA. You know, because the wow. USA has 22, somewhere between estimated between 20 and 22% shift workers. That puts them in the order of around about 70 million shift workers. So we've got, oh, yeah. so the, the the amount of shift workers, because society demands this now, Simon, you know, they mm-hmm. demand the shift workers, you know, driving their cabs and, and flying planes and having the police and ambulance and para, you know paramedics and nurses and doctors and journalists and a radio to listen to and a TV to watch when you wake up in the middle of the night. You know, we demand all of that. And yeah. these are all shift workers that are working it. So what impact does that actually have on society? Massive. Bless our shift workers, Simon, because our shift workers are sacrificing their own health for you. Mm-hmm. Because research is very clear, very, very clear that shift work is a carcinogenic it creates and causes cancers it causes Mm -hmm. uh, cardiovascular disease it causes all sorts of problems to people's health now why does this occur this actually happens because we have what's known as in simple terms we have a circadian rhythm which is a body clock which runs biological daytime biological nighttime you don't have to be a rocket scientist to work out that the biological day is when it's light and the biological night is when it's dark Mm-hmm. Now, if you ever want to know what your true biological clock does, go camping and leave your phone behind. Because have you ever noticed that when you go camping in your years gone by and you go camping, you're sitting around a fire, you know, and it starts to get dark and you start getting tired and you're sitting around the fire and you go, God, I'm exhausted. I think I might go to bed. And then you look at your clock and it's only 7.30. Yep. It's so true. Yeah. And then when we wake up, we wake up at five, six o'clock in the morning and we're full of beans because we've woken up in a normal circadian rhythm. So if you ever want to reset and see how much of an impact electronic devices and artificial light has on our world, go camping and leave mm. your phone in the car or away because this is what happens. Um, so shift workers are living outside of their natural biological clock and this causes all sorts of um, metabolic problems to their systems and particularly more so to females than it does mm-hmm. to males. Because females have a very, very compromised digestive tract to start off with. Plus, you know, they work to a 28-day cycle as well as, you know, um, the 24-hour cycle. As, you know, and they're all over the place hormonally and things like that. And when you throw shift work into that, when your body is trying to function outside of that, bi- that, that biological day and night, that circadian rhythm. So when you think about shift work, the way I look at it is we have what's known as a hypothalamus, which is a gland in our brain. And that is the conductor of the orchestra mm-hmm. because what we have is we have biological clocks in all of our tissue. Every It's now been revealed that there's a clock in every single cell in our body, right? And if you imagine the conductor playing and, and, and trying to orchestrate the orchestra, and then you look at every clock all playing their own piece of music, that's literally mm-hmm. what it's like being on shift work, you know? 
and for you, because you go to bed at night, you get mm-hmm. up during the day, you're there normally. So your orchestra is actually, you know, your conductor is conducting everything which is running normally to a biological day and night. Yeah. When you look, when you look at a shift worker at night, they're putting food into their system and our circadian rhythm responds to the time food's going in. So the body gets confused. Why is there food going in at this time? Why are we moving at this time? We shouldn't be. Why are we doing? And it creates a lot of confusion in the system. And that system, that, that confusion has a massive impact on people's health in a big way. Yeah. Well, I've never done shift work. And I think what you're describing is probably one of the reasons why I've never applied for for a shift work job and so like in the middle of the night what are people putting in their mouths like i'm assuming coffee chocolate sugar try to keep themselves awake yeah well that's one of the biggest problems that when people get tired we've got two hunger hormones simon we've got Mm -hmm. leptin which is our satiety hormone that makes us feel really good and then we've got ghrelin and ghrelin is you know have you ever noticed that when you have a late night you you always feel hungry the next day like yep. you're always like, you know, if you sit up and watch a, you know, you're going to watch a, a late cricket match or you're going to watch a T20 or a final of Wimbledon or something like that. And you go to bed and then you wake up in the morning early and because the kids get you up and you just cannot fill yourself up. You're just hungry all mm. the goddamn time. And you just think to yourself, God damn it. I'm so hungry. Why is that? That is ghrelin. That's the ghrelin, the hunger hormone that comes from your stomach, which is actually tricking you into searching for glucose for energy now glucose comes in the form of carbohydrate which is sugar you know mm-hmm. like glucose is sugar which is carbohydrate now whether that's fruits and vegetables or whether it's chocolate what we're looking for is we're looking for a quick fix our body is literally searching for a quick fix to get some energy but the problem that we have when we put that glucose or that carbohydrate into our system is we spike and then mm-hmm. we crash then we spike and then we crash. And this is what becomes really, really unhealthy for shift workers overnight. Because overnight, our body doesn't produce the insulin that's needed because our pancreas is in rest mode. It's sleeping. Mm -hmm. So when we force ourselves in, and it's common for shift workers that are tired to start jamming biscuits and chips and lollies and, you know, and all that highly palatable food into our gob, because we're hungry or we think that we're hungry because we're tired. So we start jamming that in, but we're not producing the insulin to transport it around the body. It floats around our bloodstream as glucose. It's got nowhere to go. So it ends up parking as body fat and generally around the middle. And that's where shift workers find they end up with more visceral fat around their middle, Mm -hmm. then end up with this, you know, beer gut, um, this problem that they, well, we call it a beer gut, don't we here? But, you know, it's more visceral fat around our midriff. Um, and it causes us all sorts of health problems, um, cardiovascular disease and health problems there like that. So um, uh, that's what we need to avoid on night shift. Yeah. And do you see any trends with new new shift workers coming into the force or nurses, doctors or whoever, whatever their job is, are they consuming different types of food to more veterans like yourself or is it, it, it doesn't matter, it doesn't discriminate? It doesn't discriminate. It's it's literally people having whatever they feel like. People accidentally call they don't accidentally, people deliberately call it cravings and they justify it by calling it a craving. Yeah. But once you if you become very mindful, like really mindful of what ghrelin is and what leptin is and the metabolic process that's caused you to crave. And I mm-hmm. use crave with the in the quote um, to crave these things. It is literally your body tricking you into trying to search for instant energy, um, being glucose, um, and so that's why we tend to to go for those foods. But the reason why I'm here doing what I'm doing today, Simon, is purely because health and well-being in workplaces is totally non-existent around health and well-being for shift workers in particular. There is. Yep. Uh, and there's no one or there's only a couple of people that I've been able to find worldwide that are still doing shift work, that, that they're not only still doing shift work, but they're now coaching shift workers. I've got many people that are coaching shift workers that oh, they live with a shift worker or mm-hmm. they, they think they know shift work or they've studied shift work or whatever. But you've got to have actually gone through shift work and done shift work or be doing shift work to be able to empathize with the people with what they're actually telling you instead of what you've read somewhere. 
Yeah. It's that um, that shared journey, that shared lived experience that helps, I guess, A, get the connection between you and the shift worker, but also, yeah, to, as you said, to, to sink in and, and you know what they're saying and they're feeling and they've experienced because you've done it yourself as well. Um, you've made the mistakes, but you've also, you know, made recovery journeys or you've made improvements based on those mistakes. So it's that shared lived experience, which is, is crucial in that coaching or even therapeutic relationship that people have with, with their clients as well. I mean, it's your own journey, isn't it? You know, yeah. you've got to have come through those things to actually understand and be empathetic to what a person is mm. feeling, you know, to be buckled mentally and then to come out of it with strategies to come out of it. Um, I think it's really important. And that's why a lot of clients come to me. They say to me, because I ask them the question, why have you chosen me as your coach? Because you get it, because yep. you're doing it. You understand it. Yeah, definitely. And that's why I share my my story as well. So I'm starting my mental health therapy business for, for men um, to open up as part of the Mindful Men brand. And, and, and I share my story with the hope that other people can go, oh, yeah, Simon's done that. Or well, he's lived through it. He understands what I, I'm feeling, I'm thinking, or, or I'm experiencing as well. And, and, you know, no topics off limits because you know, I've probably thought about it or, or experienced it myself as well. And it sounds like you're doing the same. So I was interested to hear your perspective on double shifts. I know we've had COVID. So we're coming out of COVID and a lot of the people who do shift work, you know, particularly in hospitals still there, if you've got COVID, you still got to stay home. And so then that puts pressure on other workers around you to maybe pick up another shift. And my, my brother, uh, his partner is a nurse and she recently did a double shift um, as a nurse. And so I'm, I'm interested to hear like, what is the impact you're going through a shift and then you might have to do a double shift We're in COVID or we're coming out of COVID the impacts on the body, like, how tired do you actually get? How hungry do you get? How do people even get through these one shift, but then also two shifts? Uh, this is very valid at the moment. It's very topical as well, because um, all of the emergency services are massively under pressure at the moment, like hugely under pressure, um, purely because of isolation. One person in the workplace gets COVID, five are close contacts, so they've all got to be um, furloughed. They're off, mm -hmm. everyone's off, and it's putting a lot of pressure. And nurses in particular, bless them, because I've structured my whole business model around a nurse um, that's sort of, you know, around that 35 years of age with two children and um, whatever, mm. so um, that really struggles with it. Um, I think nurses are probably the most brutalised of the lot with rostering as well. Because of this, and they do end up doing those two shifts, those double shifts um, or extended shifts, or they end up working 16 hours. I think paramedics are another one that's a good one as well, Simon, because, you know, they can do a 14-hour shift and end up ramped at a hospital and do 16 hours. And, so yeah. have, and this is where I coach shift workers to have ready high protein snacks with them or to carry things with them that they can actually eat to sustain themselves and keep themselves going. How tired do you get? Incredibly tired. And then, it, and then you can go through a whole cycle. It's really, really bad to be doing double shifts and extended shifts. Full yeah. stop. Um, and people coming out of night shift that stay awake all day to try and get back into sync with their circadian rhythm, that's another no-no as well because it causes you all sorts of grief. So the impact on that is, is enormous because when you understand the processes, the longer you stay awake, the more sleep pressure builds up in our brain, right? We get mm -hmm. sleep pressure that builds and that's what they call the sleep homeostat. And with the heat sleep homeostat building, 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 and you haven't been able to sleep, what happens when you get in your car to drive home? I wouldn't like to imagine, you know? No, that's right. And that's why we can find shift workers falling asleep at the lights. They're not drugged. They're just literally, the sleep pressure is built to the stage where they've literally closed their eyes in a blink and they've fallen asleep in that yep. split second. Um, and then when they get home, they can't sleep, which is a classic problem for a shift worker as well. And, and you mentioned that like your business was structured around a nurse with two kids. So yeah. they, obviously they're going home and they're, they're being parents. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. You know, and, and shift working... Um, females need to have really strong and supportive husbands as well like really really good strong and supportive husbands because you know financially shift work is is enormously beneficial simon and that's why a lot of people do do shift work 
Mm -hmm. um, not only because of the roles that they're performing. Like if you want to be a nurse, you know that you're going to have to do shift work. If you want to be a paramedic or police or fire, you know you got to be a shift worker. You know, everybody knows that they've got to do those things, right? But the problem is um, you need a good support unit at home. And this is where women doing shift work, the husbands need to be a really good supporter. Or if a husband's doing shift work as well, we can actually find that men doing the shift work with the women at home, a lot of men can feel very guilty. And mm -hmm. when they come home, instead of prioritizing that sleep, they, they feel so guilty that they tend to try and step up and do absolutely everything to help their wives as well. And as much as bless them for thinking that way, they'd be better off going and getting four, four and a half hours sleep and being really present and up and about um, in that period of time. Yeah. Does that make sense? What I was it does about? actually. I've seen a lot of um, social media. I follow a few few guys who work in the mines and they have that similar feeling of guilt. They're away for weeks on end, come home. And because mine, mining is shift workers in, in, in many mines and then they come home and they're, they're trying to do the same thing. They're trying to catch up on the weeks that they haven't been there. Right now, Simon, that's I'm trying to get contact into the mines at the moment for the health and well-being. Um, and, and I've, I struggle to find a contact to do that, um, because I want to be able to do health and wellbeing workshops to literally deal with that, that yeah. is one of the things, because when you are on your two weeks on and then your two weeks off or, or, you know, three on and one off or however the system works for, for that particular work, we really do need to address that guilt because that guilt is real. It's very, very real for men that go away to the mines and then come back. And because they've been away, they feel so guilty. So they feel like they need to be up the whole time working. Whereas they're exhausted. They're tired. Mm. They bring good money home. They're really tired. They need to get that rest, sleep, get back into that normal. Because a lot of them, you know, will go and do a week of nights and a week of days or a week of days and then a week of nights and then come back. And they're exhausted. And they yeah. would be better off taking a few days to recover and then being a hundred percent present instead of, uh, and, and managing the, the psychological side of managing that guilt as well. Mm. I think that's a, it's a really valid point. And I think working with that is, um, is a really important thing to do moving forward. Yeah. Now you're a, you're a Mac nutrition uni certified nutritionist. Yes. Uh, right. Bit of a tongue twister. Um, it, Tell us about what this means to you and like what it is, how do you do it? How does it all make sense for you and how then you use that in your coaching for other shift workers? Yeah. So when I was, when I was actually looking to do nutrition, I went and saw Martin McDonald, who's um, the head of Mac nutrition uni. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw him do a, uh, a stand up talk in, um, at the convention center here in Melbourne on the 1st of July, 2019. And um, I spoke to him because his course is very, very unique. Mm -hmm. Only 400 applicants a year get to do it because it's it's a gold standard in nutrition course. Like it's it's what they call evidence-based. Yep. Now what an evidence-based practitioner is, an evidence-based practitioner is actually a person who totally understands research, reads research and can debunk, debunk myths or look at the confounding variables around research that goes, yeah, I know that paper said that, but, you know, and you can break all those sort of things down, right? Mm -hmm. So I spoke to Martin and I said to Martin, hey, I'm a veteran shift worker, but I want to really coach shift workers. And the first thing he said to me was, oh, the best advice that you can give a shift worker is tell them not to do shift work. And I said, that's great, Martin, but we need shift workers. Yep, maybe we do, but tell them not to do shift work. And I said, so when you pick up your phone and dial triple zero, who's going to answer it? Who's mm. going to come and help you? If you have a turn and you have a medical episode or something happens, who's going to turn up? So what I want to do is I want to teach people the best possible way to go about doing shift work from an evidence-based perspective. Mm -hmm. I want to learn how to read research. I want to understand how to find research. I want to understand best practices for shift workers, albeit that's bad. How can we make it better? And he just said, stop doing it. But anyway... I met him and, and we chatted and I, I had a photo taken with him and I tagged him in the photo. About two weeks later, he came back to me and he said to me, I'm offering you a position on the course. I've been thinking about what you said. I'm offering you a position on the course because I think there's a lot of validity in what you're actually saying mm. around shift workers. And I knew I was on a niche. I knew I was in a, a world niche area because yeah. there's not many people that do what I do around nutrition. 
And when that happened, I jumped at it and I studied, Mac Nutrition is based out of the UK, so it was done online. So I was blessed that I could still study and still go through it, even during COVID, right? So I could watch the lectures, I could do the the quizzes. The exams nearly killed me, the exam period, which is a two week period where we have to do four exams that I thought I was gonna die from stress. And in the middle of the study, in the middle of the course, halfway through the course, I actually had what's known as a tran- uh, transit ischemic attack, which is a TIA uh, minor stroke, which gave me a little bit of a setback, but I made a full recovery from that. And it was out of that that I decided that what I'm going to do is I'm going to get certified. I made me more determined to get certified. I finished that. And then I decided that I was going to start my business so that I could help shift workers to manage not only nutrition around shift work, but I wanted to branch into health and well-being and educate shift workers around the importance of managing stress, being mindful and practicing gratitude around a lot of things because it makes an enormous difference. And I think you've probably read The Resilience Project from Hugh Van Kylenberg. No, I haven't actually. No. Tell us a bit about it. Simon, Hugh Van Kylenberg is, wrote a book called The Resilience Project. It is it's a life-changing book. Um, on my Instagram profile, I've got a review of two of the books. Mm-hmm. One of them, his first book is called The Resilience Project. The audio book is worth listening to just in itself because he is the best storyteller I've ever heard, Hugh. He actually tells stories around practicing the gem principle and he talks about the gem principle as gratitude, empathy and mindfulness. And I think when you practice gratitude, empathy, and mindfulness in your life, you actually change the filter of what you're looking at life through completely. Now, I can see you nodding, and I know that you totally subscribe to this, don't you? Yes, I do. Well, this is mindful men to its core, really, you know. Absolutely mindful men. Because if we understand, if I can just, if I may, just talk about my knowledge around this as well, because... As you know, we have a reticular activating part of our brain and the reticular activating is, is it's a filter between our senses and what our brain actually processes, right? So what happens is we, we see, touch, smell, look at and hear a number of things during the day, millions of things that occur during the day. But our brain can't cope with all of that. So we have a reticular activating system which actually filters out things that we just are not necessary or we don't need. And a classic example of that is when you decide that you're going to buy that latest color flat gray car and you think, I'm going to buy this flat gray car. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? Mm -hmm. And then you're going to buy this flat gray car and you're going to have it because it's unique and there's no others on the road and nobody else has got it. So you go to the car yard, you buy the car and you're that excited, you drive it out. And then all of a sudden, every fifth goddamn car on the road is the same car as yours, isn't it? Yes. I'm seeing that with Teslas at the moment. I just, I saw one and now I see a million of them. (laughs) Now, when people understand how that works and why that works, It's because before that flat gray car meant nothing to you. So your brain was just filtering out that side of the information. Whereas when you actually, it means something to you, the brain allows that information to go through. So through neuroplasticity, we are changing the way our brain thinks, right? And looks at things. Now, if you apply that to things in life with what you've done, and particularly, this is what I work on with shift workers and frontline emergency service workers because they're under enormous amounts of stress all the time, Simon, right? So what I do is I work on this um, particular gratitude Mm -hmm. and mindfulness with my shift workers because I get them to write gratitude journals every day with three dot points of something that they're grateful for every day. And I find that when it first happens, clients struggle because they're looking for massive things that yep. make a difference, aren't they? Yep. They're not looking for the fact that they open their bag and got their keys out and they've got keys to their own home. Oh my God, I've got my own home. And when I open the door and I walk in and shut the door, I'm safe in my own home. And that's something to be grateful for. You know, they're trying to look for... because. Social media and life teaches us now we have to look for the big things mm. that give us this massive dopamine hit and we lose sight of all the little things. You've absolutely nailed it on the head. So 
So my story is one of, I didn't really tune into mindfulness until I burned out in 2020. And people had always talked about gratitude journaling. And as a guy, and the first thing I said to myself was, I'm not doing that. You know, guys don't write journals and, and all this type of stuff. But then I got over that very quickly because I needed to help and I needed to, to get better. And and I was in the same boat. I was, I was trying to think of things that I'm grateful for. So you, you do the big things, my family, my health sometimes, um, the fact that I've got a roof over my head. Yep. But then I binned it after about a, a few weeks because it just, it just kept repeating the same things every single second day. But then recently when I've been seeing a psychologist again and he said, what you need to do, a good strategy around that to find those little things. And it could be a cup of coffee, you know? Yep. Um, it could be just a nice day outside, the, the beautiful weather or birds chirping, something that makes you feel good when you hear it is to break down your day into hours and, and yep. go, okay, and write down what did, what did you do in that hour that you felt good about? So it could be at work, you know, you got an email sent that you've been sitting on for two weeks, you know, it could be like you said, you know, you pull out your keys and, you, and you're, you're grateful that maybe you've got that flashing new gray car in your house or, or whatever it is, or it could be that you've got a brand new pair of shoes and they feel like you're floating on air when you're going for your, your lunchtime walk or something like that. And by breaking it down into those hourly slots and then thinking about all the mundane things that are in part of our life, we can actually see the good things that are in our life and the things that we're grateful for. And that in turn bring the mindfulness into our day and it helps us to slow down and de-stress and and feel good about things because you know when we're stressed and we're anxious or depressed or whatever we can often get a bit jaded as well we can feel like angry with the world you know upset with the world you know everything's everything's hard everything's you know and I, I can imagine you'd come across lots of different stories like this like how did the people that you work with approach journaling did they struggle with it I find what you're saying there the journaling and even just a gratitude. And to start off with, because one thing that I have to work with shift workers is, is time management. They don't mm. have time. So I don't I don't say to them, you've got to write a journal and you've got to write a full page in your journal. I just get them to write three dot points down mm -hmm. at the end of every day before they go to sleep. But you can't write the same three things down that you wrote down yesterday. So yep. you can't say, oh, I came home and it was great. And then next day, I came home and it was great. And the next day, I came it's got to be three different things. Because I know you understand this, Simon, but the more you practice gratitude and the more you write these things down, through neuroplasticity in your brain, you're actually rewiring your brain to look for good because you're actually teaching it to look for the good. Now, with shift workers, let's just take police, for example. They have contact with the worst of society for majority of the time that they're actually working. Mm -hmm. I've got a book, there's an emotional survival for, um, for emergency services. And this book talks about that police in particular, and paramedics are much the same as well, Simon. What they think is that 99.9% .9 of society are just absolute lunatics. They're just crazy. They're out to get them. They're, they're off the planet. They're all meth heads. They're all everything. You know as well as I do that it's it's a way less than 1% of society are like that, but their job has those people coming to them all the time, so they feel like they're the ones that are with them. But mm. when you practice gratitude of the people that are around you, your family, your children, your house, like when you woke up this morning and you went to the toilet, you hit the button and the button flushed, practice gratitude around that because yeah. people that don't get that – Go to the tap and turn the tap on and pour yourself a glass of water. Wow, water came out. And I can actually just drink. I don't have to boil it. I don't have to do anything with it. I can just drink it as it comes out. Then I just turn around to my coffee machine and make myself a coffee. And I've got coffee pod there. I can make my coffee and I can stand there and have coffee and fizz my water and do it. You know what I mean? Like, And we what we do is when we start looking at life through that lens, it literally changes the lens that we're looking at life through through our reticular activating system it changes it and through neuroplasticity our brain starts to look for the good look for it look for it because you know you've got to drop three things down so you start looking for it it's amazing how in 12 months time you don't it filters out the bad and yep. you won't actually engage with people who are negative and drainers you won't engage with them because 
you don't notice you're just not interested you're just not interested in that because you then get the sense that they are dragging you down mm. you think how can i put it sorry I know i'm going on here but if you and i were both suffering from let's just say we're both suffering from ptsd and we're in a in a forum where all we're doing is talking about this is shit this is bad this is terrible oh my god like look at what this person did oh i can't cope can't go here can't go there it keeps you in that zone yeah. all the time you've got to get out of that and surround yourself you are the sum of the five people that closest to you so get yourself out of that and focus on the positive of what is actually going on and you will rewire your brain around that now i've been under a site for two and a half years i've got no shame in saying that i've been under a site for two and a half years and i see her every other week and i find it enormously beneficial mm -hmm. to be able to do that and, and go and do that and there's no shame you'd said before that years ago when you talked about journaling oh i'm too tough for that i'm not doing journaling yep. like, what are you talking about but doesn't it just change your life Oh, definitely in the perspective. And and you mentioned also around shift workers have a time poor, you know. Um, a lot of people in society are at, at the moment very time poor. They're working from home more, so they're juggling both home, home life and work life at the same time. Shift workers, you know, they're doing long shifts. And then so when do they consume good stuff? And you mentioned audiobooks as a as a great way to you can be in your car on the way to work, or you could have it in on the earphones if you're if you're allowed to listen to earphones as well at work or at home or whatever, and you can be consuming good stuff and and be grateful when you're learning. Like I'm, I'm having a great time with you on, on today's show and, and I'm learning so much about shift work, which I never knew. And I feel grateful just being in part of this conversation. And, and I think when we can shift our focus away from maybe it's trash TV, watching too much Netflix um, or, or, or radio shows that you're not really engaging with or you don't like the presenters or or whatever it is, and, add, and then switch it and put in like a good podcast, a good audio book. Even it could be music that doesn't have any words. It could just be this, the sound of music and yes. just fill our brain with good stuff. There are little moments of gratefulness and, and mindfulness that we can bring in without even having to think about it, you know? Totally agree with you there. I honestly believe that commercial radio is dead in the water. That's my personal opinion. And I know you're going to agree with me on this, and that's why you're doing the podcast. And I just think for people that are suffering, now I, I, I listen to a podcast and I have done for the last oh, two and a half, three years. Um, I don't know whether you, you're aware of, the, are you aware of the Strong Life Project? No, no. Uh, Strong, the Strong Life Project by Sean O'Gorman. Mm -hmm. He's an ex-policeman from New South, uh, from Queensland, uh, ex-dog handler, um, broken up with his wife, suffered from PTSD, depression, suicidal, um, was really bad. And he's researched a whole journey to come out of that. Now, his podcast goes for 11 minutes every single day, mm -hmm. and it is exhilarating. It really does hit you in the feels of, you have to take responsibility. No one's coming to save you. If you want the result, you have to do the work. And I totally agree with that. Um, and I do. Because you can leave yourself. And he, he talks about all of what we've just talked about. And Sean has really helped me no end just through a podcast, through free information. Yeah. Now, I, if I haven't listened to Sean's podcast for a while and I've, I'm going to go for a drive over to see one of my kids and, and I've got a 45-minute journey, I can smash out four of Sean's podcasts on the way over there, you know? Yeah. And I listen to one after the other. And by the time I get over to see my kids, I'm pumped and ready to go, you know? Um, I wouldn't listen to commercial radio. One of the other problems with stress is we don't educate ourselves. Podcasts are great to educate yourselves in areas that interest you. Now, this podcast that we're doing now, it's going to interest a lot of people, but there's going to be a lot of people that it doesn't interest hmm. at all to yeah. listen to us banging on, right? <laughs> but that's the beauty of this medium. You can hmm. choose to listen to it. Some people will want to listen to um, a podcast about um, building houses. Yeah. You know, that wouldn't interest me in the slightest, but how good is it that people can actually listen to a podcast on how to build a house, you yeah. know, like, and so on and so forth. And I think this is where... We are lucky. Audio books now, we can actually put it in. We can listen to an audio book while we're on the road or while we're in, in the air or we're flying or we're doing something. Or we can actually listen to podcasts back to back um, and, and draw information out of it that we actually want to draw out of it. And this is where I steer my shift workers into enhancing your knowledge in yeah. areas that interest you instead of getting so bogged down in 
the shit that we live in today or that you allow yourself to live in if you don't practice this gratitude. Now, I'm going to go back to this point. Hugh Van Kolenberg's book, The Resilience Project, I I implore that anybody listening to this actually gets hold of this book. It's called The Resilience Project. There's three books that I highly recommend in life. One's Atomic Habits, which you're probably aware of. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Atomic Habits is excellent. The other one is um, The Resilience Project by Hugh Van Kolenberg. I highly recommend that people listen to it because he's such a good storyteller. And then his follow-up book to that is called Let Go. Mm -hmm. Now, the good thing about his book called Let Go is he actually documented his sessions with his own psych when he burnt out himself. And he's turned that into a book and it's fascinating. It is so good. And it talks about um, letting go of, uh, he doesn't carry his phone. He He's uninstalled Facebook and Instagram off his phone. If he does, It doesn't mean he's not on them, but it means he's got to go to his computer to use mm-hmm. them. And, and letting go of things, um, really, really important. They're both fantastic books to listen to, and you'll smash them out because he's such a good storyteller. Wonderful. You might find the link, we'll get the links off you and, and put them in the show notes because it'd be great. I'm keen to, to check them out as well. I'm always looking for good resources and so oh, forth. So oh, The gem principle that Hugh talks about, gratitude, empathy, and mindfulness, I've brought forward into my own coaching because yep. it is so goddamn powerful, Simon. Um, um, and I highly recommend that people listen to it. Yeah. I'll send you the links um, via the email and you can um, add them into the show notes because these books are phenomenal. So tell us about a healthy shift and what's some of the things that people can ex- expect from you if they're, they're going to do some coaching with you. You've also got the podcast as well. So tell us a bit about yeah what's happening with a healthy shift. Okay, so with a healthy shift at the moment, what I'm doing is I'm uh, I one-to-one coach. I've got very, very limited spots that I take people. The one thing that I want people to understand about a healthy shift is as well, is it's not only for shift workers, it's about people that want to make a healthy shift, as in from a poor place to a good place. Yeah. And even though it's reflective of a healthy shift, shift work, and I'm a veteran shift worker and I want to teach shift workers how to thrive, not just survive, I do coach people, I coach performance athletes as well, um, and I want to, I'm want i coaching two um, Aussie Rules footballers at the moment, working around tweaking their nutrition to learn more about that, mm-hmm. and we're getting phenomenal results. But what I do is I coach people, and they have a weekly Zoom session with me that goes for half an hour, or 40 minutes, until we run out of time, as you know. <laughs> and what we do is we talk about roadblocks that they've had during the week and we work through those roadblocks and I give them like worksheets to work through, which are just very short worksheets to create their thinking processes. I coach people in intuitive eating. So Mm -hmm. I'm not coaching them. It's not tracking macros and this is how you lose weight, et cetera, et cetera. It's more about mindful practices because the byproduct of that is um, is weight loss. It's about the dieting culture has actually killed us off. The mm. more we diet, the worse we end up um, because yo-yo dieting is the problem for a lot of people. So what I do is I work with people around that and um, and every week we have they do a check-in on a Sunday. They submit their worksheet. They give me the check-in, which is set questions. And then on the Monday or the Tuesday or the Sunday because it's, they're shift workers and I move them around, I sit down and we have a a 30 minute Zoom where we go through and cover off on any roadblocks that they've hit and we work through those roadblocks. So I imagine my client is standing on one mountain, I'm standing on another mountain. It's my job to navigate them to me, to where I'm at, so that they can live a, um, you know, they can thrive in shift work and not just survive. I like the sound of the not tracking like your macros and all that because when we're when we're trying to lose weight and a lot of us are in that boat. I'm I'm the same. It's one of the things that just turns you away from doing anything because it's just so much effort to look at calories and sugar intake and all that type of stuff. So I like the mindfulness approach, more of a just being that that awareness of what you're putting into your body and how it reacts with your body as well. Well, what we do is I'm doing what's called intuitive eating. So it is mindful eating, Simon, very much. What we tend to do is we demonize food and you don't realize that when you when you say, I'm going on a diet on Monday, what you do is you go through the last supper on Saturday and Sunday, you just completely engorge yourself. Yeah. And then you go into this restrict diet, which is unsustainable, where you can't have this, you can't have that. And when you can't have something, it's all you want. 
But what I do is we don't have any Last Supper. We literally just ease into it and we talk about dieting culture and how dieting culture has actually ruined the way that we think. And if you think about it, when you were growing up, I'm not sure whether you were in this position, but I know I was. When you were growing up, you weren't allowed to leave the table until your plate was empty. Yeah. And that's the worst possible thing that you can do to children. The worst. Because we've now got, I've now got clients that I'm trying to break that habit out of them that you don't, you, it's okay to leave food. It's going to be there the next day or later on. And it's okay that some days we eat a little bit more and on other days we eat a little bit less. But mm. it's about attunement and getting back in touch with our hunger and satiety signals and giving ourselves permission to eat. And it's amazing that when you give yourself permission to eat all foods, that you don't, it doesn't have the impact that you think it will have. And to demonize carbohydrate or demonize sugar or to go keto or something like that, it is not the answer. Because my advice to people is simple. If what you're doing today is not something that you're going to be wanting to do in 12 months time, don't even start it now because you're not going to sustain it. And if you lose weight, if you lose five kilos, like, you know, Jenny at the office has gone on keto and she's dropped five kilos. That's all well and good. But watch Jenny at the office in, in, 12 weeks and another yeah. 12 weeks and she's put the 10 kilos on not the five because yo-yo dieting is literally what happens um it's yeah. really bad so i teach people sustainable practice where there's no pressure of tracking you we've talked a little bit about stress today and i'm and i'm wondering like a shift worker might come home they're really stressed and they might crack a beer yep. as a de-stress type thing how, how does alcohol impact of what you're doing in, in terms of working with the shift workers and, and monitor and being mindful of nutrition as well. It's really important that people understand. I think it's really, really important that people understand that the body sees alcohol as a poison, right? Mm -hmm. So whether you enjoy it or whether you don't enjoy it or whatever it is, but your body sees alcohol as a poison. So it shelves all the other substrates while it's getting rid of the poison out of the system. And it puts a massive strain on the system. So for argument's sake, you come home and you know, you have yourself a couple of beers or you have yourself a wine or, you know, your two wines or whatever. All of a sudden, your judgment around nutrition is clouded. That's when mm -hmm. you go to the cupboard and you grab your packet of chips or your um, packet of biscuits or, you know, you want to have your ice cream or you want to, you know, do popcorn. We got to do whatever. Alcohol impairs rational thinking around food. But not only that, but whatever food that you've eaten around that alcohol, your body will shelve it and park it as body fat while it gets rid of the poison. And that's what people don't understand. And that's why people who drink alcohol, and I'm not demonizing alcohol because everything in moderation, obviously, mm -hmm. Simon. I mean, if people choose not to drink or don't want to drink, that's their prerogative at all. I certainly do myself, but you know, you've got to be mindful around what you're actually doing with it and be aware that it will lead to poor choices and it will lead to weight gain because your body will actually part the substrates while it's getting rid of the toxin out of the body and it puts strain on it. Yeah. But it's not the solution. It's medicating. It's self-medicating, as you know, and it does cause more problems because people use alcohol to numb a problem. But then what happens is when they come out of it, they've actually added to that problem because they've added metabolic problems. They've added... Um, weight to the situation they've come out of it with a headache or not feeling fantastic guilt about what they've actually done mm -hmm. and then it goes around in that ever ever cycle that you've got to break into and um yeah. it does cause massive problems alcohol yeah now how can people find find you like what's the best place for them to to if they want to learn more about what you do or get in contact how can they find you yeah um, I'm um, on Instagram as um, a healthy shift. So it's a underscore healthy underscore shift. And, and that's going extremely well. I put my reels and posts up there in relation to shift work or mindfulness and, and it's all evidence-based. So it gets rid of all the garbage. Mm -hmm. um, I've also got a website there, which is a healthy shift.com. Yep. So people can find me on a healthy shift.com, read all about me and what I'm actually doing and how I'm going about it. Um, if people are looking for coaching, if there's something that I've said that's resonated with them that they feel like they could connect with me, then you can come through. I offer a free, um, what they call a discovery call with person where I'll have a chat with them for half an hour to see whether we would be a good fit for coaching. And my coaching is for a minimum of 12 weeks because of yep. the style of how I go about doing what I'm doing. Um, I also run my own podcast, which is... Um, 
just simply called A Healthy Shift, where on Monday and Friday at 6 a.m., I drop espresso episodes. The espresso episodes generally last somewhere between 10 and 15. They were supposed to be between 8 and 12, yep. but they seem to be 10 and 15. And anyone <laughs> listening to it now will understand why. I love it, Chad. Um, <laughs> So it'd be 10 to 15 minutes. And what they are is just a snapshot of something around shift work or a strategy around shift work or supplementation or things like that. That drops on Monday and Friday and the following Monday. And then every second week, um, I put up a, uh, a guest interview, which is an expert in their field of sleep, shift work, nutrition, um, mindset, body coach, whatever. It's um, all of those sort of things. And, um, uh, and I share that. Um, share those which are going it's gaining a lot of traction and I'm really really proud of the podcast and like yeah. you probably enjoy doing it I absolutely love putting them together I do and I love having chats with people like yourself and, and I've, I've listened to your podcast and I really enjoy some of those those episodes so it's it's certainly recommended and I'll be putting the links in the in the show notes both to the to the website um, the podcast but also the books that we talked about earlier as well um, but I'll give you a couple more questions and I'll let you go um, Picture someone who's like a shift worker, maybe struggling physically or mentally at work or, or at home. Um, and from your experience, what's some tips that you can provide to perhaps push them in a direction where they can start looking at or being, being mindful of what's happening, why they're struggling, and maybe how they can improve? I think the, the word mindful is, I think, is really important. We need to practice gratitude of what we actually have instead of worrying so much about chasing the dopamine hit for what we don't have. Mm -hmm. Because that dopamine hit that you get from buying the new car, buying the new house, buying the new laptop, buying the new camera, whatever, it doesn't last, Simon, does it? Like, it doesn't no. last you, you're always chasing that dopamine hit. So be grateful with what you've got and with your surroundings. Now, in relation to a shift worker, I always say one of the biggest problems that shift workers have is they want to start on Monday. It's the same with every dieter. They want to start on Monday and then it's all or nothing. And yep. all or nothing generally ends up in nothing. It never ends up. It, it starts with all and it ends up in nothing. And I'm a very, very big advocate for taking ownership of where you're at, accepting where you're at, and putting a one percenter in place to start stepping in the right direction. Yeah. And I think, I honestly believe, and that's why I so strongly believe in your principles of what you're doing in relation to this podcast as well. And that is, I honestly believe that mindfulness is the key and practicing gratitude. Um, because I think when you do that, you change the filter and you do become much happier in your own life. And I've found with shift working clients that have come to me overweight, highly stressed, wanting to diet, wanting to lose body fat. When we practice gratitude and mindfulness, it literally changes the way that they look at things and the mm. way that they feel about things because we do get caught in this vortex, don't we, Simon? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think, um, and I think you can turn that around, and you absolutely can turn that around, and you should have confidence that you can. But my five principles of health that I have for everybody is number one is sleep. Sleep must be a priority for everybody. And if you're sitting there watching something on Netflix and binging on that at night, ask yourself if you would set an alarm for 5 a.m. to get up and watch it. Because if you wouldn't set an alarm to get up and watch it at 5 a.m., go the hell to bed now. Mm, yep. Because... What you're impacting on is your health in a really, really big way. And I know people say, oh, but I'm winding down. You're actually not. Watching the TV is blue light exposure. It's also stimulating your brain. You're concentrating on what you're doing. It's it's not. So if you wouldn't set an alarm for 5 a.m. to get up and watch it, don't watch it now. Go to bed, right? Because it's always yep. there, Netflix. The next one is nutrition. And it's just going for a higher protein and higher fiber diet. And we are what we eat. So the better... The more nutritious food that we put into our system, we don't demonize food, but there is more nutritious food and there is less nutritious food as well, obviously. And there is a direct correlation between what we eat and how we feel. There's no doubt about it, all right? When people are up and about when they're eating really good nutritious food, and then there's, you know, you when you're sitting there slamming biscuits on the couch at night, you do, you feel awful, right? Now, I'm not demonizing, demonizing biscuits in any way whatsoever. It's your choice. If you want to do that, that's fine. But don't complain that you're feeling really, really ordinary mm -hmm. because of it, right? So that's nutrition. The other one's hydration. 
Now, I focus on hydration because it's amazing the difference that hydration makes. People try and slam two litres in a day or people try to put eight cups in or the evidence is very simple. If you have clear or straw coloured urine, you mm-hmm. are properly hydrated. It is literally that simple. If you go to the bathroom and your urine is yellowy colour, then it's time to drink up because water is actually the essence of life in our body and it keeps the cells energised and it keeps us going really well. The, the sensor for nutrition and for hunger is also in the same place in the brain and it can get very confused. You can think you're hungry and you can drink a fair bit of water and you find suddenly it wasn't actually hunger, it was dehydration. Mm-hmm. So don't confuse hunger with dehydration. So that's h- hydration. The next one is movement. Now, I actually move away from exercise or a workout. It's movement. Acknowledge your body moving. Take yourself for a walk. You don't have to carve out an hour every single day to go for a great long 10,000 steps. You can go for a walk around the block. Research shows that when we are vertical and in forward motion, our mental health is a lot better. And mm-hmm. that's, that's what research shows. So by being vertical in a forward motion, it strengthens our mental health with anxiety and, um, and depression. And also, if you get out during the day in our vitamin D window, which is if your shadow is shorter than you are tall, then that means that you're getting vitamin D, 15 minutes a day of vitamin D. It's our happy hormone. It keeps us feeling really, really good as well. And the last one we have to manage is stress, right? Super important to manage stress. Stress has an enormous impact on our health and well-being. Um, and to manage stress, and one of the best ways to manage stress I have come across without any doubt whatsoever, is to be vigilant of how you're breathing. If you're breathing through your mouth, you are stressed. Uh, you're in your, what they call a sympathetic state. Mm-hmm. If you're breathing through your nose, you are actually in a parasympathetic state, which is where we want to live. Now, it's okay to be in a sympathetic state at times. Like if you're doing a, a weight workout or you're going for a run or you're exercising, that's a good stress. We want to be in that stress because it's important that we stress our body a little bit in that stage but it's not a good place to live. And we need to get back into that parasympathetic side very quickly. And the way we do that is literally to close our mouth and breathe through our nose for four seconds, hold for a second, and then breathe out through our nose for six seconds. And if you do a few cycles of that, you'll feel yourself really calming down. And that's your body switching, the autonomous nervous system switching over to the parasympathetic side and you'll notice that you will feel calmer and you will feel a lot better. And there's another book for you too, Simon. Um, Breathe by James Nestor. It is mm-hmm. phenomenal. I'll be sure to check it out. And you've touched on a few things that are, that are stress relievers anyway, like the exercise, the vitamin D, healthy eating, switching off the telly. All those things are natural stress relievers in themselves. And you also even touched on seeing your psych or seeing someone, a coach, It can be anything. It doesn't have to be the traditional Western medicine. It could be a mindfulness practitioner. It could be someone doing yoga, Pilates, doing something, um, you know, vertically, as you're saying, um, these are all natural stress relievers. And I think the more we can talk about that and be okay with talking about going to see a psych or being on medication or doing all these things, the more we can normalize our mental health and, and well-being and you know because we when we get injured and or something like we hurt a leg we we naturally go I'm, I'm yeah i'm gonna go see a doctor or a physio or or whatever and get that fixed and that's okay to talk about so we should be okay with just saying yep i've got to go see a psych or social worker like myself or a coach like you um yep. yeah and that's okay whatever works for you it's not going to work for everybody but you know there, there's so many options out there to 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 get well and healthy and and thrive, as, as you're saying, instead of just surviving. So, it's really blessed in this country as well, Simon, because at the moment, you're like, you can go and see your GP and you can get a health plan, healthcare mm-hmm. plan, and you get 12 free sessions with a psych. Now, that doesn't mean that you've got to use 12 in 12 days, you know. You can get 12 sessions with a psych and you could go, you know, and, and just establish a relationship with a psych. It's yep. so... It's so good for the soul, isn't it? Now, you know, because you do it yourself, mm-hmm. it's free in this country under Medicare. We can actually do it. All you got to do is go and see your doctor and he will write you a healthcare plan. You can go and find a psych that will, that will do it on Medicare and you can sit down and you can actually just 
talk through for an hour and then build a relationship so that you can go back to them and talk to them about these things. So beneficial. And it's something that I've got no shame in saying, I go and see my psych and I'm going to go and see my psych here and I'm going to go and see my psych. Or I've just come from the psych or I'm doing that. You know, I've got no shame in doing that at all. You know, mm. none. However, and yeah, I'm on medication myself as well. So I've got no shame in even saying that because that makes me feel good. Yeah. And that, there should be no demonizing around that either. It, it, it makes me feel good. It gets me to the stage where I'm nicely balanced now. Yeah. And, and I often find that a lot of guys, particularly, or, or people in general, they, they say it costs too much. And, you, and you're saying that with the, you know, the mental health care plans, you can get subsidized or if, and, and in some cases, free sessions as well. But, but also, I think it's just a cultural thing in Australia, particularly, we'd be happy to go out for a night out, spend a couple hundred dollars doing that where we could also spend that same money improving, you know, our health and well-being through a coach or a, a psych or a dietitian, or whatever, you know, it is, you know, I guess it's just about priorities. I talk about this a lot. People won't pay for a one-to-one -one coach, right, in, in nutrition, which is mm. for their health and well-being. But they'll go down to the shops and they'll go and buy a new suit where they've paid seven or $800 for it, a new pair of shoes that's cost them 250 a brand new shirt that's cost them 150 The girls will go and get their tanning done, their waxing done, their hair done, their nails done, buy a new dress, new shoes, to catch an Uber to go into town, yep. spend 250 bucks at a restaurant and come back, but they won't spend any money on a health and wellbeing coach. And I, I, it, it's a real mind I won't use the word, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it does my head in. It does my head in is the way I can put that. And it's it's really boggling as to that people won't prioritise. And there's no excuse here because you can go and see a doctor. It's bulk bill. Mm -hmm. You can get a health care plan and medications. Medications are cheap as chips as well because our government subsidises those. You can get a health care plan where it's not costing you anything to see a psych. So you're only making excuses. That's all you're doing. You're not You're yeah. not actually being true to yourself. Or yeah. there's lack of education around it that we need to educate people on that. Yeah, and there's conversations like this that we're having today, I think can help to inspire people to start shifting this focus and, and this mindset and, and start looking after their well-being. But, but Roger, I could talk to you all day, literally. <laughs> but I'm going to let you go. Um, appreciate your time. So I really have enjoyed it. You've given us lots of plugs of, of books and I'll get all the links from you um, and we'll share them in the show notes so that people can check them out. Check out the Instagram page. I, I love the Instagram page because I'm on Instagram myself and and I'm just really grateful that you've you've come on the show today and, and shared your journey. I'm super grateful for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Simon. It's uh, it's great to be able to talk about it. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure that you like it and leave a comment and then share it with your mates. Also, subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss a moment of future episodes to come.